All right, so this is going to be the next video uh, on the AnyCubic Slicer. Uh, we're looking at version 1.44. Um, so you've already downloaded it. You've already opened it. You might realize that there is a new version of this um, called AnyCubic Next Slicer. Um, great branding. Um, but we're going to stick with the version 1.44. It's the one we're most familiar with. So if you are participating in the Design to Make a Difference program, uh, this is the one that we covered at our training. It's the one you're going to want to use um, if you have one of two printers that we have been donating. The Any Cubic Cobra 2 Pro, that's new for our 2024-2025 um, school year. Or the Any Cubic Cobra 2 is the one we gave out last year. They look almost identical to one another. Um, they function in a little bit different of a way, specifically in how fast they can print. So you just can't use one profile. You have to be able to toggle back and forth if you're going to switch between the machines. If you're not, if you're just going to use one printer, well, just select the one from the beginning and stick with it. So the first thing we're going to look at is how to toggle back and forth. Right now, I'm on the AnyCubic Cobra 2 Pro. This is the size of the uh, build plate. It's identical to the Cobra 2. Um, some of the settings are different though. So when I go into, and I move my uh, menu down here, more settings. If this is the only thing you take away from this video, it's the most important thing. For some reason, when you're at the filament portion of the settings, these are the default temperatures for the Cobra 2. Pro 215 and 60. I've never changed the 60 in my entire life. I do occasionally bump this up to 230 for some of the newer high speed filaments. Um, you can get away with 215, but if you ever feel a print's not as good as you want it to in terms of like how it looks, how it's um, um, sticking to uh, the individual layers, um, you can go ahead and try to bump that up a little bit to 230 can actually do that on the printer while it's printing without worrying about the settings. We'll show you that in a different video. Now, if I want to toggle to the AnyCubic Cobra 2, not the Pro, I move this little uh, um, slider up and I have access to my machine and I pull down the drop down menu and I pick AnyCubic Cobra 2. No change. It looks like there was a change. There really wasn't because the beds are identical. But, and I still don't know why it does this. And it really is um, something if you don't catch it can mess up some prints. When I go into settings again, more settings, and I go to the filament, I have no idea why, but the defaults are set to 215 and 40. 40 degrees Celsius for the bed temperature is not hot enough. These parts will cool, they will fall off the bed. This needs to be set at 60. I've sent emails, I've written letters. I tried to drive to any cubic, it was too far away. So set that to 260. Now there's really difficult ways to save things. So the easiest way I found to save this is to actually toggle back to the AnyCubic Cobra 2 Pro. And when it does, I'm going to say save. And I'm going to name this so I know what it is. I'm going to call it PLA215-60 to remind me of what those temperatures are. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Now, again, I'm back to the Cobra 2 Pro. Those settings should be the same because their default was 215.60. When I go back to the Cobra 2, fingers crossed, those settings are 215.40. Because I'm under generic PLA Cobra 2, those settings did not get saved there. If you remember, I made a new name. So when I come up the filament, if I push down that drop down menu, it's all the way at the bottom. And now when I click on it, those settings are saved. It is the most bizarre thing. I don't know why they, they don't change it, probably because they've updated to the new uh, software. So when in doubt, if 
you're using the Cobra 2, not the Pro, just double check the bed temperature and make sure it's at 60. All right. The majority of this video is going to be about using supports for your parts. You might have a more complex part that isn't super flat, isn't really that geometric, might require some support material. If you don't know what support material is and you don't remember from our first training, awesome, this is gonna help you out. If you've been using supports and you just haven't found the right settings, this hopefully is gonna help you out as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you of when I would need supports and when I wouldn't, I'm gonna bring in two different parts. Um, the first part I'm gonna bring in is the part from our first video. Um, it's a book opener. It helps me hold a book open with one hand. And this part does not need supports. There is nowhere that this part should fail because the plastic doesn't have anything under it to help it print. I know you're sitting there thinking, what, is that? what does that mean? Um, so it's much easier to show you with a part. Um, those of you that know me, you know I'm a diehard D&D junkie. So I'm going to bring in a part that I'm working on. Yes. For an encounter for my D&D &D party. I am the dungeon master. I make these cool little 3D structures um, and the players can see how they're playing. So this is a really different type of part. I did not design this. I purchased it, but I do want to print it so I can paint it and build it. Now, these parts are kind of on top of one another. I want to remind you how we can use this layout tool to help me space them properly. And now these parts are going to print at the same time. But there's some areas. And right now, I want to make sure you see where they're at. I have support turned off. And if you've already watched our first video, right now is when we hit slice now because we're ready to go. We're ready to get this part onto the 3D printer. If you just watch that video, you realize how fast it sliced that part. This is definitely more complex. It's taking a little bit more of com like computing power, if you will. And it already gives me a warning. It's letting me know that number one, it's not going to stick to the bed that well. And there's some other terms that I'm not even going to get into. I'm going to delete this and I'm going to show you what it looks like. And we can just talk about physics, right? There's a few parts that if I look at this, by scrolling around and looking, they're super complex parts. There's like a dragon head, there's this archway, and you can see it's highlighted, this little blue color stands out, right? And if I use my little slider to go through the timeline, we're good until we get to about here. Now, this printer actually might have no problem printing this. It's a really high quality printer. But just to make sure, because as this plastic gets laid one layer at a time down, there's nothing underneath it for this plastic to rest on. Gravity will do its thing. And if there's nothing underneath it, it'll pull the plastic down and it'll look, uh, in a non-technical term, kind of droopy, uh, if it even prints at all. So this is an area where this print might fail. It would be awesome if there was something underneath it to support it. Now, why don't we need support material over here? Because it's laying down plastic underneath it that's actually part of the model and it self supports with the layer underneath it. So we can see early on, on this complex part, we don't need anything. And even little kind of uh, angles overhangs like this, it probably has no issue. But when we start to get to these steeper overhangs that are meant like kind of highlighted in this blue area, the printer might have some trouble. Also, we get to some kind of right angles right there, right? There is nothing underneath this plastic to support it. And that's where you're going to have either some ugly prints. If this is parts that need to kind of mesh up together, if you're building something, you want them to kind of like fit snugly. So this is when that support material is going to come in handy. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. We're going to go ahead and return to the editor. And I'm going to 
open up the menu for support. There's a few options. And again, I'm assuming that we're all closer to the beginner stage. Um, as you get more experience, you can go ahead and try to mess with some of these settings. But for right now, this video is definitely aimed at some of the beginners. So I'm going to recommend you just put support everywhere. Now, the defaults are really bad. This support material, you're going to want to break off. You're going to want to remove. It is not part of the model. It is waste. It helps the model print successfully. So anything that sticks too much is going to be a pain. Anything that sticks too little is not going to function. So we want this kind of Goldilocks happy medium. Um, and, and we think we found it with our settings. So I'm going to go ahead into more settings. I'm going to look at this kind of set of menus over here to the left, and I'm going to go to support material. And there's only a few buttons I'm going to change. I'm going to make sure that these supports are organic. I can show you what the difference is towards the end of the video. The first thing I'm going to change is the top contact Z distance. And the cool thing about this slicer, if you just hover your mouse over it, it, it opens up this little text box and kind of tells you what it means. The vertical distance between object and support material interface. Setting this to zero will prevent any cubic from using bridge flow and speed for the first object layer. So they lost me right at that last sentence. The vertical distance between the object and the support material interface. The bigger that number is, the further the gap is between your part and the support material. The further away it is, the easier it is to break it off. If it's too far away, it doesn't do its job. So I know 0.28 millimeters means nothing, and that's okay. But changing this to 0.3, a difference of two hundredths of a millimeter, actually makes a significant difference. I found it much easier to break parts off if we just increase that distance ever so slightly. This is true for the Cobra 2 and the Cobra 2 Pro. So it doesn't matter which printer you're using. These are the recommended support settings specifically from us here at Design to Make a Difference. There's only one other thing I will change. I come down and it tells me how many interface layers there are. How many layers are kind of designed to touch the part? And right now it says three, heavy. I'm going to change it to zero. It still has the support material do its job. It makes it so much easier to break the support material away. And that's all I'm going to change. There's so much more I could change. There's so much more I could experiment with. Just those two changes. Again, the Z top distance, contact Z distance, excuse me, 0.3. And the top interface layers, zero. Again, there's no real way to hit save. There's no save button. I just X out of this. And now, since I have support on everywhere, um, in the last video, we talked about the brim. I'm going to turn it on here because there's not a lot that actually touches the bed. And I'm going to hit slice now. Take a sip of coffee while I'm waiting for the computer to do its thing. And we're going to see when the part pops up, we're going to have some um, different colors that preview the part. And right now, green has always been the kind of waste plastic that we're going to throw away. That's normally the color of the brim. And I see it here again. So all of these weird parts are the organic support structures. And if I look and I watch all of this plastic, one, it's hollow, so we're not wasting too much. But it now is going to be the support for this layer underneath. And because we have the settings that we have, it's going to be easy to break it off. I know it looks like it's going to be stuck and it's going to be part of your model. All right, if I can zoom in on that, <laughs> it doesn't do it justice. But if you look, oh, it's going to do it. There's actually a distance between those two layers. It's enough to add support, but it still lets you break it 
off later and it will easily come off. Um, I can use my hands. It hurts sometimes just because it's sharp. So I usually use a pair of like needle nose pliers, but everywhere there was a chance for that plastic to kind of fall down on itself because there was nothing underneath. I now see the screen support material that's going to help that part print successfully. It might not be perfect. It is definitely going to be much better though. And again, I do the same exact thing. When I'm ready to go, I hit export G code. I put a flash drive in that I'm doing live right now. I know you're going to pop up twice because you always do. And I go ahead and export that G code to the local disk. I find the USB drive and I go ahead and I hit save. And I take that flash drive to the printer and I am ready to go. Now, oh yes, I didn't take my own advice from the last video, fantastic. I took the flash drive out when it was, um, it told me it was exporting. That's bad. I'm gonna do it again. I love making mistakes live. One take. When I hit export G code, I'm gonna export to the local disk. I'm gonna find that USB drive. I'm gonna download it again. I need to wait for this window to say exporting finished. It takes a little bit more time because there's more code. But if I wait long enough, there it is, exporting finished. Now I can take the flash drive to the printer and I can go ahead and access it from the touch screen and start it up. The difference in the type of support material. If I return to the editor. Under more setting, there's a few different types of supports. We chose organic. Let's look at what grid does. And I'm gonna hit slice now. I'll wait for it to go ahead and do its computer algorithmic decision-making. It's a technical term. And it looks like there's a whole bunch more support material. And when I kind of zoom in on it, I just see that these are now lines instead of those kind of things that almost look like roots of trees um, or tree branches. In fact, on other slicers, they're called tree-like supports. On this one, they're called organic. But in a very similar way, this is stuff that I can break off later. Let's see what the last one looks like. I'm not, whoop grid snug we'll do the same thing one last time again the more complex of the part the longer it takes to slice um, it's break, basically breaking down this part into individual layers and kind of writing the code down of where the nozzle should go and when it should lay down plastic. Um, and that's referred to as G code. It's one of the earliest forms of computer code that was ever created, to be honest. So we go ahead and we scroll down and it looks very similar. There's not much difference between snug um, and grid. I do, I just have more um, success with the organic supports. So that is what I would recommend. Um, and if you do that and you're a beginner, um, your part should print successfully um, and you might waste a little bit. It's definitely going to take longer because more plastic means more time, um, but you'll get a successful print and you can go ahead and break those supports off using just like a pair of needle nose pliers. All right. I hope that helped. Um, enjoy the printing. And um, again, think about how you can do like awesome stuff uh, with your students with these machines, right? Dungeons and Dragons is fun but helping someone hold a book open is probably more impactful. All right, thank you very much.